Hello, curious minds. Imagine looking up at the moon one night and knowing it's no longer a barren wasteland, but a thriving world with oceans, forests, and maybe even cities. Could we actually turn this dream into reality? Let's explore if we can terraform the moon and whether we should even try. Before we start drawing up blueprints for lunar colonies and planning moon-based gardens, let's talk about why we'd even consider terraforming the moon. It's not like we're running out of space on Earth, right? Well, not exactly. But expanding beyond Earth isn't just about finding a planetary lifeboat. Think about it. The moon is a treasure trove of scientific opportunity. Its pristine environment holds secrets about the early solar system, preserved for billions of years. A permanent base on the moon would allow us to delve deeper into these mysteries. Imagine astronomers setting up shop on the far side of the moon, shielded from Earth's radio noise, peering into the universe with clarity. Geologists could study lunar craters, piecing together the moon's formation. The moon could become the ultimate off-world laboratory, conducting experiments and making observations impossible on Earth. It's like giving the scientific community a state-of-the-art research facility, with the added bonus of breathtaking views of Earth. Okay, but let's say you're more concerned with practicalities like avoiding a giant asteroid. A self-sustaining colony on the moon looks like a good insurance policy. Think of it as humanity's backup drive. We all love Earth, but it's unpredictable. Asteroids, supervolcanoes, pandemics, Earth's history is full of potential extinction events. Having a second home on the moon ensures our species' survival, a place where humans could thrive independently, ensuring that even if the unthinkable happens, we wouldn't go extinct. It's not just about surviving disasters. A lunar colony could serve as a stepping stone for further exploration. With a permanent base on the moon, we could mine resources and test new technologies. Terraforming the moon might seem far-fetched, but it could be key to ensuring humanity's long-term survival. It's about taking our destiny into our own hands, becoming a multi-planetary species, and securing a future for ourselves among the stars. The question is, can we actually do it? And if we can, should we? All right, so we've established that terraforming the moon would be pretty awesome. But let's get real for a second. The moon as it stands is very hospitable to life. One of the biggest challenges we'd face is the moon's almost non-existent atmosphere. I mean, we're talking about a near-perfect vacuum here. Earth's atmosphere is a luxurious blanket of gases compared to the wisp of sodium and potassium that surrounds the moon. Without a substantial atmosphere, there's no air to breathe, no protection from harmful radiation, and no way to regulate temperature. On Earth, our atmosphere acts like a giant planetary shield, protecting us from meteoroids, filtering out harmful radiation from the sun, and trapping heat. The moon, on the other hand, is constantly bombarded by cosmic rays, solar flares, and micrometeoroids. And speaking of temperature, without an atmosphere to regulate things, the moon experiences some pretty wild swings. During the lunar day, temperatures can soar up to 127 degrees Celsius, or 260 degrees Fahrenheit. At night, they plummet to a freezing minus 173 degrees Celsius or minus 280 degrees Fahrenheit. Talk about extreme weather. Now, if the lack of a breathable atmosphere and the extreme temperatures weren't challenging enough, let's throw in the moon's weak gravitational pull for good measure. The moon's gravity is about one-sixth that of Earth's, which means it has a hard time holding on to any gases that might be present. Any atmosphere we manage to create on the moon would slowly, but surely escape into space. It'd be like trying to inflate a tire with a hole in it. And it's not just the atmosphere that's affected by low gravity. Our bodies have evolved over millions of years to thrive in Earth's gravity. Prolonged exposure to low gravity can lead to muscle and bone loss, cardiovascular problems, and a whole host of other health issues. So if we're talking about living on the moon long term, we'd need to find ways to create artificial gravity or develop technologies that mitigate the negative effects of low gravity on the human body. It's a tall order, but hey, we're talking about terraforming the moon here, so challenging is kind of par for the course. Okay, so we've got a lack of atmosphere, extreme temperatures, and weak gravity to contend with. But wait, there's more. Another major challenge we'd face in terraforming the moon is the scarcity of liquid water. Now I know what you're thinking. Didn't we just talk about vast reserves of water ice at the lunar poles? And yes, recent discoveries have shown that there's quite a bit of water ice lurking in those permanently shadowed craters. 
but extracting that water, transporting it to where it's needed, and then converting it into a usable form for both humans and potential lunar ecosystems is a whole other ballgame. Think about the logistics involved. We're talking about setting up mining operations in some of the most extreme environments in the solar system. We'd need to develop technologies to drill into the lunar surface, extract the ice, purify it, and then transport it to where it's needed. And all of this would have to be done with robots or humans in spacesuits, operating in low gravity and extreme temperatures. It's a daunting task but not an insurmountable one. If we can figure out how to efficiently access and utilize the moon's water resources, it would be a major step towards making our lunar neighbor a more hospitable place. And let's not forget about magnetic field, or the lack of it. Unlike Earth, the moon lacks a global magnetic field, leaving it vulnerable to solar winds. These charged particles from the sun would strip away any atmosphere we managed to create, just as they did with Mars. Of course, there are more minor problems. Like the lunar regolith or the moon's surface dust is rich in metals but lacks organic material and nutrients needed for plant life. Plus, its sharp, abrasive particles can wreak havoc on machinery and pose significant health risks to humans, or the cost and time frame. Terraforming the moon would require enormous amounts of energy and resources. Building the infrastructure to generate an atmosphere, regulate temperatures, and sustain ecosystems would take centuries, if not millennia. The cost would likely be in the trillions of dollars, resources that might be better spent addressing problems on Earth. Okay, so the moon needs an atmosphere, a cozy blanket of air to breathe and regulate temperature. But how do you give an entire celestial body an atmospheric makeover? Well, one idea involves harnessing the power of comets. These space snowballs are loaded with frozen gases and water ice. Imagine redirecting a few or a few thousand of these icy behemoths to crash into the moon. The impacts would release these volatile compounds, potentially kickstarting the formation of an atmosphere. Now, before you picture a barrage of comets turning the moon into Swiss cheese, remember, we're talking about a controlled bombardment over a long period. We're talking about engineering projects on a time scale that makes building the pyramids look like an afternoon Lego session. It's ambitious, sure, but when has that ever stopped humanity from reaching for the stars? Literally in this case. Next up water. Our pale celestial neighbor is a pretty dry place, but fear not, because we might be able to import the most essential ingredient for life. Remember those icy comets we talked about earlier? They're not just good for delivering atmospheric gases, they're also packed with water ice. Two birds, one stone, Another option is to mine water ice from the permanently shadowed craters at the lunar poles. We know these craters harbor significant reserves of frozen water, just waiting to be thawed and put to good use. Imagine vast, shimmering lakes dotting the lunar landscape, reflecting the light of the distant sun. It's a beautiful image, isn't it? And who knows, maybe one day, we'll be sipping lunar lemonade on the shores of the Sea of Tranquility. Now let's talk temperature. The moon experiences some pretty wild swings, from scorching hot to bone-chillingly cold, not exactly ideal. One idea could involve tapping into the moon's potential geothermal energy. There are theories that the moon may still have some internal heat beneath its surface. If we could drill deep enough to access this heat, it might be used to generate energy or to warm certain areas of the moon's surface. Another option for regulating the moon's temperature involves giant space-based mirrors. Picture these mirrors strategically positioned around the moon, reflecting sunlight onto the surface and providing a more even distribution of heat. These mirrors could be precisely angled to direct sunlight to specific areas, warming up the lunar poles and creating more temperate zones. We could even adjust the mirrors to create day-night cycles, simulating the familiar rhythm of Earth. Of course, building and deploying giant space mirrors presents its own set of engineering challenges. But hey, if we can dream of terraforming an entire celestial body, surely we can figure out the logistics of some cosmic-sized mirrors, right? Another challenge is to grow plants and produce oxygen. As we talked about it earlier, the lunar soil lacks the necessary nutrients for plant growth. One idea is to import or create artificial soil by mixing lunar regolith with organic material and nutrients. In a more controlled environment, we could rely on algae and bacteria that produce oxygen through photosynthesis. These organisms could be cultivated in biodomes where artificial conditions like temperature, pressure, and lighting could be controlled. To sustain a living ecosystem, a full water cycle would be essential. One option might involve creating a hydrosphere by combining imported water with ice mined from the poles, 
then using solar-powered desalination plants to purify the water and keep the cycle going. Now let's talk about gravity problems. Since the moon's gravity is only one-sixth of Earth's, humans living there would face serious health consequences. To address this we could create artificial gravity through rotating structures or centrifuges. Another speculative idea involves creating a large-scale artificial core. By generating powerful forces deep within the moon's interior, we might be able to manipulate its gravitational field on a larger scale. However, this is pure science fiction for now. So, we've got these ambitious plans to give the moon a total makeover. But before we get carried away, let's take a moment to consider where we are with technology right now. So, how does our current technology stack up? Are we anywhere close to being able to pull this off? The short answer is, not quite yet. While we've made incredible strides in space exploration and technology, terraforming a celestial body is a whole different ballgame. It's like comparing building a sandcastle to constructing a skyscraper underwater. We're talking about challenges on a massive scale, from diverting comets and building giant space mirrors to creating self-sustaining ecosystems. It's going to require significant advancements in our understanding of planetary science, engineering, and probably a whole bunch of technologies we haven't even invented yet. Currently, lunar missions are focused on understanding the moon's resources, including water ice at the poles and the composition of lunar regolith. This knowledge is crucial for the next steps in creating a habitable environment. To start terraforming the moon, we would need to release greenhouse gases into its environment. Right now, technologies for atmospheric engineering are in their infancy. We've experimented with geoengineering on Earth, like seeding clouds to control weather patterns, and in space we're already sending missions to study Mars's atmosphere, which could offer clues for our moon project. Redirecting comets to deliver gases and water to the moon is a bold idea, but it's also one that we're just starting to think about. NASA's Asteroid Redirect mission, although it was eventually cancelled, explored the idea of redirecting asteroids to capture resources. Although comet redirection would require major advances in space navigation and propulsion systems, the groundwork has been laid for future development. As we mentioned earlier, there is significant potential for extracting water from the moon's poles, specifically in permanently shadowed craters. While we've seen early success in finding and mapping these ice reserves with robotic missions, we still lack the technology to extract, transport, and use this water effectively. Turning lunar water into something usable for life support, and eventually for agriculture, would also require advanced purification systems. Current water filtration technologies could likely be adapted for lunar use, especially in controlled habitats. NASA's water recovery system, used aboard the International Space Station is an example of how water can be purified and recycled in space. Now let's talk about energy. With the moon's lack of atmosphere and its close proximity to the sun, Solar power seems like the most feasible energy source. Solar panels are already being used in space such as on the ISS, and lunar solar farms could help provide the energy needed for various terraforming processes, like generating greenhouse gases or powering habitats. Another energy option is nuclear fission. NASA's Kylo Power Project is one example of how small, portable nuclear reactors could provide the consistent energy needed for long-term lunar missions. For terraforming, nuclear power could be used to generate the vast amounts of heat and energy required to create an atmosphere or even melt water ice. Growing food on the moon will require technology that can create self-sustaining ecosystems. Hydroponics, or growing plants in water without soil, and aeroponics, or growing plants with their roots suspended in air, are already used on the ISS and could be adapted for lunar use. Producing oxygen is another critical part of terraforming the moon. The MOXIE, or Mars Oxygen ISRU experiment, on the Mars Perseverance rover is testing the extraction of oxygen from carbon dioxide on Mars. A similar system could be developed for the moon, extracting oxygen from lunar regolith through electrolysis. And last but not least, gravity. We already know that long-term exposure to low gravity can cause significant health problems for humans. The solution? Artificial gravity. Rotating space stations or centrifuges could simulate Earth-like gravity by using centrifugal force. Although it's a concept we've seen in science fiction, rotating habitats could become a reality with future advancements in space engineering. So, we've established that terraforming the moon while a monumental task isn't entirely outside the realm of scientific possibility. But let's talk about the elephant in the room, or rather the giant rotating wad of cash being hurled into space, the cost. 
We're talking about transporting vast amounts of material across the vacuum of space, developing cutting-edge technology, and sustaining a project that could span generations. To put it in perspective, the Apollo missions, which put a few brave souls on the lunar surface for a cosmic stroll, cost roughly $150 billion in today's money. Terraforming the moon? That's like the Apollo program on steroids with a price tag that would make even the most extravagant government blush. Now we're all for pushing the boundaries of human ingenuity and exploring the cosmos, but we have to ask ourselves, is terraforming the moon the most practical use of our resources, especially when we have pressing issues here on Earth, like climate change, poverty, and that rogue asteroid I keep warning everyone about? Perhaps investing in sustainable solutions for our home planet should take precedence over building a luxury lunar condo. The ethical implications of terraforming another celestial body are as vast as space itself. Do we have the right to impose our will on another world, even if it is our closest celestial neighbor? The moon, barren as it may seem, is a pristine environment, untouched by the footprint of humanity. Terraforming it would fundamentally alter its nature, potentially erasing any scientific value it holds in its current state. Some argue that we have a moral obligation to safeguard our species by establishing a backup plan in case Earth becomes uninhabitable. And we get it, it's always wise to have a backup plan like a spare toothbrush or an extra pair of socks. But is turning the moon into Earth 2.0 really the best solution? What if, and hear us out here, we focused on not destroying our original planet in the first place? Furthermore, who gets to decide what happens to the moon? Is it a free-for-all land grab among nations, or should it be governed by international law, ensuring equitable access and resource distribution? These are questions that require careful consideration, not just by scientists and engineers, but by philosophers, ethicists, and policymakers. Finally, we need to consider the long-term implications of terraforming the moon. Now, we're not suggesting that we abandon the moon altogether. It's a treasure trove of scientific discovery, and its proximity to Earth makes it an ideal testing ground for new technologies and space exploration strategies. But before we commit to a terraforming project of such epic proportions, we need to weigh the costs, benefits, and potential consequences carefully. And, there you have it, we've explored the possibility of terraforming the moon, transforming it from a desolate rock into a second home for humanity. Now you might be expecting a definitive answer, a resounding yes or no to the question of whether we should terraform the moon. But the universe rarely deals in absolutes. If we look at it from a scientific perspective, we're obligated to tell you that more research is needed. As a human being, I'm inclined to say that we should focus on preserving the one habitable planet we know for sure. The truth is, the decision of whether or not to terraform the moon is not one that will be made by scientists or engineers alone. It will require a global conversation, a collective effort involving policymakers, ethicists, economists, and everyday citizens. It's a decision that will shape the future of humanity and our place in the cosmos. Regardless of whether we ultimately decide to terraform the moon, one thing is certain, our exploration of space is just beginning. The thirst for knowledge, the drive to push the boundaries of what's possible, is woven into the very fabric of our species. We are, after all, descended from those who looked up at the stars and dared to dream of reaching them. In the coming decades, we will witness incredible advancements in space technology, from reusable rockets to advanced propulsion systems that will make space travel more accessible and affordable than ever before. The question of terraforming the moon, at its core, is not just about engineering or economics, it's about our values, our priorities, and our vision for the future. So let us explore, let us innovate, and let us never stop questioning, never stop dreaming of what lies beyond the horizon. For in the words of the great Carl Sagan, somewhere, something incredible is waiting to be known. So what do you think? Should we attempt to terraform the moon? Or are there better ways to secure humanity's future in space? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this cosmic journey, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you won't miss our next adventure into the unknown. Thanks for watching. Until next time, keep looking up.